speaking at Buckham Ward, Virgin Atlantic. Good morning, frequent flyers. This is Wandering Scholar speaking to you from New York. Today is an exciting day as I am finally leaving the United States for a proper three-month retreat in Southeast Asia. And for the very first time, I will be flying on board the Virgin Upper Class. I arrived at JFK's Terminal 4 at 6.30am for my 8.15 departure and found my way to the Sky Priority slash Upper Class check-in facility at one end of the terminal. The Priority Channel, however, was temporarily closed. I was instead directed to one of the standard counters. Virgin's premier check-in facility is largely in line with what you'd expect from their arrival, British Airways should the exclusive channel had been open. With the ticket in hand, I was directed to the priority security, which is always a false facade here at Terminal 4. I've visited this building multiple times and the awful interior and lack of proper pre-flight facilities really is embarrassing when you consider that many passengers here are flying Emirates, Etihad and Singapore Airlines. Terminal 4 is really a high building just like the airport itself here but still a lot better than some of the worst ones here such as Terminal 1 which is just an absolute nightmare to be flying out from. The Rolex Timer is perhaps the only resemblance of JFK as one of the greatest airports in the world. The Virgin Atlantic Clubhouse is hidden upstairs near gate A34. This lounge is open to Amex Platinum and Centurion card holders, so it witnessed quite some crowd in the evenings, especially when multiple A380s are departing in the same time bank. The JFK Clubhouse is surely past its glory, but the F&B offerings, especially the a la carte dining, are definitely stand-out elements in terms of lounge standards in the United States. But again, what an irony it is that a decade old lounge is better than most of the similar facilities you would encounter in the world's wealthiest country. Today's flight across the pond is operated by a three years old Airbus 350-1000 named the Queen of the Hearts. It's actually my first time flying a 1000 variation of this aircraft and a slightly longer fuselage really emphasizes its sheer beauty. Boarding was efficient, with a surprisingly full upper class on today's daytime departure, but I don't understand why the starboard side aisle was blocked during boarding. Perhaps for my filming, I guess. I assigned myself a window seat towards the back of the cabin, as in my opinion it is either row 1 or whatever on Virgin A350. The seat is configured in a 1 2 1 adopting some of the reverse herringbone heritage. Facing the window, of course, unlike the detested coffin seats on Virgin's other aircrafts. My early boarding was greeted by an early bird champagne, which was appropriately chilled and bubbly. Cheers to a great flight ahead. I chose the daytime departure for filming purposes to get abundant natural light and food. Today's FMB agenda is to be unveiled with a breakfast after takeoff and a three course dinner before landing. And we'll just find the aeroplane, he'll speak to you just before we start. I'll descend later on this evening and he'll tell you about the latest weather and update you on our arrival time. Until then, please make yourselves at home and hope you enjoy your stay on board with us today. Thank you. Forty-four, wind one, two zero at nine, and runway two zero, right left six. Take a three-two right, American. 
Virgin 26, go back heavy. Can he tear on me 22 right line point? Out of way, 22 right, Virgin 26, go back heavy. Virgin 26, go back heavy, wind 1, 6, 8, run with 22 right, close take. Take off, 22 right, Virgin 26. Unlike some other carriers, Virgin was able to burst into action immediately after takeoff and I was sipping my mimosa in no time. Is Opening this water is literally harder than activating the emergency exit on this aircraft. The breakfast is rather brief with everything presented on one plate. The four English was accompanied by a bowl of birch and muesli, a fruit platter and an Earl Grey tea of my choice. Having attempted to shut this useless door, I digged in quickly hoping to liberate myself of the tray as the seat was actually quite cramped when having my laptop out. I didn't want to sleep a whole lot on this flight since we were landing at 9pm, so I explored around the entertainment system and it certainly was not one of the most user-friendly one. In hindsight, this communal space behind business class is perhaps a better way to consume the time I had than struggling with the entertainment system. Though admittedly this space was rather deserted on today's flight, it's not the most useful designer so you cannot really strike a conversation with the fellow frequent flyer wanker in the absence of free flow drinks served by a bartender. The vast majority of the flight was gone by as I was watching a movie from my own device. Of course, Virgin do provide a noise cancelling headphone for those who are triumphant in figuring out the entertainment system. The final one third of the flight was kicked off with an aperitif and followed by a grilled prawn appetizer, which is the best dish on today's flight. The roasted chicken on the other hand is bathed in chipotle sauce which tasted like barbecue sauce from a dispenser that I still vividly recall to this date. The catering on today's flight demonstrates Virgin's monetary investment but the outcome left a lot to be desired when departing JFK. The amenity kit used to be a nice souvenir to take from every flight, but Virgin is replacing it with a creased paper bag that is in every way opposite of upper class. This comes as offensive as airlines that no longer offer physical frequent flyer cards. The scenic approach to London wraps up my first Virgin flight, which met the expectation but didn't quite stand up to the hype. Virgin may be an interesting niche airline to try if you have yet to done so, but anything aside from their A350 is quite off-putting. Just like the conversation I had with one of the crew on board, Virgin is eccentric in many ways in terms of an airline, but this exotic brand may not be for the majority. In the absence of a substantial fare difference, I would, without doubt, choose British Airways on this route as their new club suite and catering is consistently excellent from my past experience. After all, who doesn't like to have a One World Emerald status if you are dumping tens of thousands of dollars on the world's most lucrative air route? Thank you for watching this Wandering Scholar video and for keeping me accompanied once again on board this transatlantic flight. 
It has been a pleasure, and I can't wait for our next departure. Good day. Thank you.